History of Aviation podcast with Derek Beeler, David Rowe, and David Gorman. Hello, friends, and welcome to the History of Aviation podcast. I'm Derek Beeler, joined by Mr. David Rowe and Dave Gorman. On this episode 40, number 40, we'll be discussing the Bell 47. And this is Dave Gorman, and the, uh, the Bell 47 is a single rotor, single engine light helicopter manufactured by Bell Helicopter. It was based on the third Bell 30 prototype. It was the company's first teles- helicopter designed by uh, designer Arthur M. Young. And the 47 became the first helicopter uh, certified for civilian use uh, on, on the 8th of March of 1946. Yeah, and uh, it's uh, quite a legendary helicopter. Uh, uh, you've seen it on TV. You've seen it, uh, you know, for 40 years almost. Uh, just everywhere you look, it's somewhere to be seen. Uh, that Arthur Young designer guy, he was a pretty smart fellow, apparently. Uh, I was looking back at some videos of him. Uh, he just up and decided he was going to make a helicopter. And he studied for 12 years. He worked on it. And uh, there's videos of him with little model helicopters that are nothing more than just like a pyramid with uh, made out of metal and a helicopter blade on top. And it's flopping around and just, you know, going crazy. And he creates the fly bar, gets some stability in it. When he got that figured out, he made a little model, a literal remote control model, and, you know, figured out how to fly it. And then he took it to Bell and introduced it to uh, uh, Mr. Bell. And he was like, yeah, this will work. Let's get started on it. And the next thing you know, we've got this helicopter. Yeah, it's pretty fantastic when you think about it. We mentioned this was the first one certified for civilian use. It obviously, and we're going to get to it soon, saw military application quite a bit, and that may be its most famous role. But, uh, you know, there were some other military helicopters that were already out there in, in development and use, even some in, in uh, World War II that saw some limited use on our side. The Germans had some that they were working on as well. But uh, but this this is an iconic design, uh, familiar to viewers of TV shows like MASH. And uh, yep. I first became aware of this thing when the uh, the Batman movie, which we were talking about a little bit before we came on the air here. Uh, <laughs> the 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 uh, the idea of Batman scaling down the rope and fighting off a shark while uh, dangling underneath the bat copter. But what a, what a cool invention it was. What a cool uh, bat toy that he had. Uh, I, I saw another, another reference. I forgot all about it, but an, uh, a, a Bell 47 was used in Thunderball, uh, <laughs> which uh, the James Bond movie with uh, that opening scene with the, with the Vulcan being uh, hijacked and everything. So uh, it, it's been around a lot and uh, really a, a very familiar helicopter. Also, the only helicopter I've ever personally flown in is a Bell 47. Really? So, oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, you should do something and rectify that. There's a few others out there. Well, I absolutely can, and and hopefully that is a uh, that is a goal and a resolution for 2024 is to get a little bit more uh, uh, vertical rotor time in. I'll, I'll have some opportunities, hopefully, at some shows this year. Um, the 47 I flew in was up at Oshkosh. That is a bargain. I forget what it was, maybe $70 for a 10-minute flight, but it's fantastic, that big bubble canopy. <laughs> Definitely worth the time. Well, you know, speaking of Oshkosh and Air Venture, the uh, I I watched a little walk around video that they did of the the Bell forty seven that they use up there. They actually have three. Uh, they've got two with wooden propellers and or or blades, and one with metal blades. And they said they fly three thousand people in a week in those Bell forty sevens. So those things wow. are moving all week long. Well, and and. Considering that for five hours a day or four hours a day, they've, they've got flight operations with uh, with the air show going on. They're not flying all day. They're they're getting it, getting it in before the uh, flying begins for the main show, and uh, sometimes in the evening. It, it's it's just awesome, and it's it's definitely worth the time and trouble to take a take a, a flight over. Uh, and just look at the you know ten thousand aircraft on the field. It's a great platform for uh, taking video and and pictures and everything. It's it's fantastic. 
Well, yeah, speaking of visibility, it's got that giant soap bubble looking, you know, canopy in front. So, I mean, visibility is, you know, every direction, it's clear. Well, you think about that and you compare it to some of the uh, earlier helicopters or contemporary helicopters. Um, this really was a, uh, a forward thinking as well as forward looking design that, that as you said, soap bubble. Uh, it's it's supreme visibility in that thing. So, uh, of its time, there were there was a, a lot of there were some other helicopters that had some metal framing that really kind of limited the uh, forward visibility to what you might see in a standard aircraft. This this one was really an outlier. Well, and as a matter of fact, it did actually come. So the the Model B, uh, it came with a a metal frame. Uh, fuselage around it it wasn't the open bubble so they did have some models that were enclosed uh, yeah we so, should say this is the this is the 47g that has the bubble right correct yeah that's the it's sort of the military version the military is what went with the the full bubble and some of the earlier ones were more conventional looking well as as we have seen in so many aircraft we profiled the uh the most successful ones usually didn't start off with their um you know with with all the all the features that they uh, later became known for so this was a a work in progress as well wasn't it oh absolutely there uh what was it there's models a through h uh a 47j ranger and then all the way up to the k model uh apparently that was a luxury version that was really spiffy and uh but it didn't fly uh didn't didn't get many customers i guess i should say and uh so there but i mean all the way up to a k model so that's a lot of time for you know variants and changes and like you were saying that g model was the one that seemed to have the most success there were a lot of sub variants to the g so it was the most popular of the bunch yeah and so some of those changes over time which we'll delve in, delve into included uh expanded seating from two seats to four seats, um, different engines, uh, blades that went from wooden blades, uh, composite uh, wooden and metal, and then uh, I, I think all steel towards the end. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. So, uh, um, but... you know, the, the development of this helicopter uh, forged in peacetime, coming out of peacetime, really, uh, coming out of war into peacetime, and then adapted yeah. for military use, and, and some of those changes became uh, uh, really uh, essential to its success on the uh, uh, in Korea. And uh, I, did I read also the first news helicopter was a, a Bell forty seven with a video from maybe traffic copter uh, video from the air. Exactly, it was called the Telecopter. Uh, it was for uh, KTLA in Los Angeles, California. Uh, there was a, an inventor, a John Silva, that uh, put a, uh, a vacuum tube system on the helicopter. And uh, on what was it, uh, July the third of nineteen fifty-eight, they went up and uh, to do a you know a live view from the sky. And apparently, the the shaking of the helicopter broke some of the vacuum tubes. So they couldn't do it that day. He had to repair it overnight. And so on July the 4th of 1958 was the actual first, uh, you know, eye in the sky situation. So and it was in a Bell 47, <laughs> the telecopter. Well, and 10 years later, we were sending back video from the moon. So uh, small steps, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it began, yep. with a, began with a Bell 47. Pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, just a, an amazing platform that's, you know, huge you know capabilities for such a little helicopter it's not a very big machine uh it's just fairly simple but man it uh uh what all could it do it was uh we did the uh, news gathering uh crop dusting it's a trainer uh you could do power line patrols aerial photography search and rescue i mean this was another one that you know when you've got capabilities they put it to use well, and again, sometimes those capabilities uh, weren't discovered until the need arose and, and it was adapted and, and uh, pressed into service in lots and lots of different ways. Um, I was particularly fascinated to see about uh, one of these that landed 
on a mountaintop, I think in, in Switzerland or something at like 15,000 feet or 16,000 feet, a guy landed on Mont Blanc uh, yeah. in, uh, in one of these. And I thought, well, well you know, the ceiling, uh, and I, I guess he had oxygen uh, available to him, but, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty good uh, high altitude there. operation. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Uh, yeah. Derek said it's it's up there. It's up there. <laughs> that down. is up there. Uh what was it? Uh was it eighteen thousand feet? Somebody flew it to yeah, uh in nineteen forty nine, a Bell forty seven set an altitude record of eighteen thousand five hundred and fifty feet. So yeah, it uh it can go up there if it needs to. Well, you know, that's that's pretty amazing was that a company pilot that did that or was that a uh you know military use what was going on uh, it just listed as a date and that the somebody in a bell did it it doesn't give who was the pilot or anything i don't have any further details i i guarantee they sold some helicopters because of that, that oh number. yeah <laughs> i'm sure they did they well i mean they sold a lot of them they built over five thousand of these things uh, and the, I, I was surprised at that number. You know, I mean, I don't remember the first time I saw one in person. Uh, and it's not real common to see them at air shows. You know, I mean, Oshkosh always has two or three that are in operation. In 2016, up at uh, Thunder Over, Michigan, they had a helicopter dressed up somewhat like the bat copter. I don't fly with the wings because that's not real conducive to, uh, to lift anymore. But, um, you know, that... There are all those that are out there. There's plenty of them that are still in use. There's a lot of them in museums. This is not a hard one to go and find, but uh, but seeing it perform in air shows or flying around, it it's it's a thrill because uh, you know it's a you know it's gosh it's an eighty year old helicopter almost. Right, it sure is. Uh, the wings on that bat copter, the 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 bat wings, uh, they reduced the power by half. Uh, when that was flying so yeah that that is not something you want to fly around with regularly that's a real real hindrance to to stable flight well i i have to tell you i was a little bit crushed to find out that batman wasn't really at the controls of the helic of the bat copter <laughs> during the movie or robin while batman was fighting off the uh, uh, derek crushed me told me that was not a real shark is that what i'm hearing that's not yeah i'm sorry <sighs> But he had shark repellent. If it wasn't he had a real shark, shark, yes, uh, Robin hanging down from shark repellent, if I remember correctly. Yeah, you you cannot trust anything you see. Sometimes you just I have know. to dig a little <laughs> bit deeper. So five year old Dave is is quietly sobbing on the inside today, learning the hard truth of, of <laughs> Hollywood fakery. But what a what a cool what a cool thing! And so when I did see the bat copter or a a uh, Bell forty seven G dressed up like the bat copter at that air show a couple of years ago. I was, I was a little bit more excited than maybe I should have been <laughs> quite a thrill to see. Yeah. Well, it's a legend, you know, the bat copter, come on, that's legendary machine right there. Now Definitely. Um, the, the, the second huge uh, and probably more familiar again, you know, we, oh, <laughs> all right, Derek has put the video of Batman <laughs> fighting the shark. Look at him go. Look, he's got. He's he, got him. I'm telling you. So you're telling me that that shark is not not a real shark. No. Okay. I, I've I'm I've got some thinking to do. I may need a little <laughs> little quiet time here. So man, hey, did you know the name of the shark in Jaws? No. Oh, Bruce, look it up. <laughs> there you go. Okay, back to. Back to uh, <laughs> another famous use of the Bell 47. You know, we were talking when, uh, earlier about the Corsair and Baba Black Sheep a couple of episodes ago. And, uh, you know, how men of a certain age, boys of a certain age, people of a certain age became enamored of the Corsair because of Baba Black Sheep. Uh, the the uh, media that introduced the Bell 47 to so many people across the country was MASH. Yeah, MASH was a big one. Yep. TV Every... show that dramatized the uh, Mobile Army Surgical Hospital uh, in Korea and during the Korean War and made it, you know, uh, made it uh, kind of a comedy and everything. But the seriousness of their mission 
and those helicopters coming through the uh, the mountains of California, as it turned out. But, you know, uh, very iconic. They had the litters uh, on the skids that they could carry. Um, doctors came up, ducked their head down and, and checked on the patients that were in the litters. Uh, you saw this utility helicopter that was, uh, you know, being, uh, being used to save lives. So um, you think about the development by Bell in late World War II and then uh, civilian certified right after World War II and then being pressed into service in the military. It was uh, the right helicopter at the right time for that kind of use, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. They, uh, you know, the Army saw the capabilities of it. And, uh, well, the Army Air Corps, which became the Air Force, they were the main uh, people who were grabbing a hold of it. But, yeah, they, they saw what it was capable of doing, and they modified it with those little, uh, you know, what do they call them, uh, medic, the medical letters? evacuation panniers, uh, one on each skid, and it had a little ac acrylic glass cover in front to uh, break the wind off of the soldiers as they were flying through the air. Uh, and I was reading, they could put, you know, one on each side of the helicopter in those small beds and they could put two people in the cockpit with the pilot. So it could literally carry up to wow. four people uh, at a time. So, you know, you got two seriously wounded outside and two what they called walking wounded inside with the pilot. So, I mean, you know, you need to get somewhere quick. This was the way to do it. Uh, it was a, uh, you know, much better than waiting for a vehicle to, to come and, you know, drive you the 20 miles. You could just hop in a helicopter and 10 minutes later, you're you're seeing some help. Yeah, you mentioned that about the interior seating, the, the flight I took at Oshkosh. I was surprised that it, it was a bench and not like a bucket seat so that they, they could have put three people in the cockpit, me, the pilot and the, another guy. I'm I'm a little on the uh, the, the hefty side. And so the pilot decided <laughs> against adding another person to the cockpit, which was fine with me. It meant I had more room to to, to shoot video. So, absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, one of the interesting things is the. Uh, uh, did you know that the Bell Forty Seven was actually an Air Force One? That uh, President Dwight Eisenhower took a flight in the helicopter. Uh, it was for a practice on a nuclear evacuation scenario. Uh, and they had the helicopter set up. So the pilot sat in the front, the president sat to the right in the back, and a Secret Service agent sat on the left. So they had a different cockpit set up so that you could have all three of those people in the helicopter at one time. So it was technically Air Force One for uh, for the first time in, hmm. as a helicopter. And don't they have, uh, I guess, that exact helicopter? Um, up at the Air Force Museum as part of their Air Force One exhibit. I uh, they do I have, have one up I there. I have seen. I have seen. Now that's the military. There's at the the Sioux. What was that? The H thirteen. Yes, H thirteen yeah. Sioux. So they they have one up there that is uh, painted that way. I'm almost certain I've seen it there. Uh, if not there, it's at Udvar Hazi in D.C. But I think it's part of the Air Force Museum's um, Air Force One collection. Yeah, I think cool. you're right. Yeah. And Udvar Hazi has three different ones. Uh, they actually have a Model 30 replica. I'm not sure if it's it's a replica or if it's real, but they've got a Model 30. They've got a, a B model, which is, uh, I think it was like the 36th helicopter built. Uh, and it flew for over 40 years. I think it has the record for the longest flight history of a helicopter. Uh, and then they've got a, a third one, uh, I think it's a G model, but anyway, there. So you know, if you're in DC, there are, you know multiple opportunities to see a Bell Forty Seven. I was trying to see if there were any uh, any TV stations that still use one for their traffic coverage or news coverage. Um, you know, it seems now kind of quaint and kind of tiny compared to what they have, but you know, you had guys in the cockpit with a, with a camera on their shoulder pointing it out the window. And now they've got those, those uh, cameras that they have mounted underneath that are all controlled by a computer that you can zoom in on. So probably a lot safer. You're not hanging out the, uh, out the <laughs> soap bubble. Well, exactly. Yeah. You, you don't, 
stick your head out. That's not the smartest way to do it these days. Uh, I think most of the helicopters that are still in service are used in crop dusting. I think that has the reason this helicopter is still around is because of its capabilities in the crop dusting area. Uh, there's a lot of them out there in the countryside doing that. Well, you know, it, it certainly is uh, with that type of use, that's that's um, easy to control and easy to turn and, and good low low altitude uh, handling and everything like that with, with crop uh, pesticide application or whatever you might be applying from the skies. So that would make sense. Oh, yeah. Uh, an interesting little tidbit. So uh, uh, Arthur Young designed the, the sway bar on the, uh, the up, uh, underneath the blades. There's a, a weight that goes 90 degrees to it. And he created that to create some stability in the blades as they rotate. Well, one of the things that they were talking about with the crop dusters is they'll remove that sway bar because it weighs about 30 pounds and you can add 30 more pounds of whatever they're spraying to the helicopter. So it's a little harder to control, but you get more weight and you know, you can carry more. And as a crop duster, that's exactly what they're looking for. So uh, that was an interesting thing is they're, you know, removing some stability, but yet gaining more capability. <laughs> well, I guess if you know what you're doing, that seems to make sense. That kind of trade off. <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, that Arthur Young got a patent out of that sway bar. So when he created it, he uh, he earned a patent on it. So pretty impressive. Well, I know when I fly again on a forty-seven up at Oshkosh, I'll be sure to look up and confirm that the sway bar is still there. <laughs> I'll feel yeah. safer. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, did you know that NASA flew the Bell forty-seven? Well, I, I saw a reference about uh, Gene Certain that he had a, a kind of famous accident. I think he put it down in a canal. Uh, there was uh, some training that was done on this helicopter. I guess some of the controls were set up perhaps as a like a simulator or something where they were training for some maneuvering on the, uh, the lunar module. And uh, he was... Not long before his mission, I think he had a uh, a crack up and, and was uh, it wasn't as bad as Chuck Yeager and the broken ribs before his uh, his flight that was dramatized in the right stuff. But uh, he got he got banged up, didn't he? Correct. Yeah, he, he uh, crashed into the Indian River in Florida in 1971, and it was just a few weeks before he was supposed to launch. So, yeah, uh, you know, mm -hmm. they. Uh, he uh, got lucky there and still made his flight. Well, um, was it, was I correct about that? Was it used as like a, a simulator for the lunar module? Is that what you what you saw? Yeah, it was a, a trainer for the lunar lander. So you know, lunar I don't know exactly yeah. what they you know how they changed it, but it was it was used in their training for landing for the lunar lander. Goodness gracious. Well, you know, that uh, that flying bedstead, they got that thing to fly. So this had to be a yeah. a much safer alternative for some of their some of their needs. Yeah, that, that bedstead thing was crazy looking. <laughs> when you climbed on that, you just had to know there was waiting for something to go wrong. Well, you know, by 1970 or 71, you were saying, you know, this helicopter was already 25 years old. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it. it uh, it's such a, a versatile uh, machine. Um, and some of these, you know, in MASH, we usually, the pictures that we have behind us, we see with that open frame of the, the fuselage. Uh, but but these were also designed to be covered up, right? Yes, absolutely. The civilian versions were, were typically clad in, you know, metal skin. They had a cockpit around them. They had doors. Uh, you know, they had a smaller window area, uh, you know, so there were several very, they had wheels. Uh, some of the civilian ones had actual wheels instead of the skids. Yeah. Uh, so there were multiple versions of this, uh, you know, through development. Uh, if you look at them, they, they almost look like a fifties design. Some of the, the way the car looked in the fifties, this is kind of how the helicopter looked. It had that fifties vibe 
uh, going around it because that was the design style of the day. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, they, they definitely had, you know, everything going from front to back clad, but for military purposes, that's not necessary. They just need the structure and the strength and uh, the visibility. Well, I guess that that was uh, also kind of a surprise as you start leading into this a little bit and, and learning more about it to see the uh, the exposed structure because we're just used to, you know, with aircraft that are flying, you don't see any of that stuff typically, you know, and here it had it all out there and you thought, well, I guess it doesn't really need the skin uh, for, for its for its needs. Um, you got some stats on its uh, speed. Uh, yeah, it uh, goes about 105 miles per hour, uh, cruises is about 84 miles per hour, and it's got a range of about 246 miles. So, uh, and, and is it it's controllable by uh, a pilot or co-pilot, correct? Or was yes. it just pilot, uh, just controls on one side? No, they it was dual. The ones that I saw were most of them dual control. Dual control, yeah. Yes. Uh, and and one of the things I heard one of the pilots talking about is you can't fly the helicopter too fast because the uh, I think it's the blade that's going rearward will stall and it will flip the helicopter over. Hmm. So you've got to Whoa. watch your speed and not fly too fast. Well, that would get your attention, wouldn't it? Well, <laughs> that would end your day, among oh other gosh. things. That would that would uh, be a oh. Bad way to end the day, that's for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Um, all right, I have a question. This may be an opinion thing. Neither of us, none of us have flown a helicopter, correct? Correct. I mean, uh, at, at the controls. Uh, no. I've flown a remote control helicopter. Does that count? Well, it might. And from, Does flight simulator count? Because I crashed a helicopter on flight simulator once. <laughs> well, see, that's that kind of goes along with my question. Because, Derek, mm -hmm. you do have several hours in the cockpit of, of small uh, uh, civilian aircraft. Mm -hmm. Is it easier to learn to fly a helicopter without having the uh, fixed rig, fixed wing experience, or are you better off starting fixed wing and going to helicopter? I um, have an answer. Let's hear it because I'm not. I've never been in the cockpit of a helicopter. So, at, a so real it's helicopter. Significantly different in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, the 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 motion and and the the rotor and everything but you know fly it well, with or is it with the, what you got with it okay Go the ahead, the i watched a video uh in researching one of the helicopter uh shows that we have done in the past and they were asking one of the instructors that very question and his answer was yes it is easier to teach someone who has never flown before to fly a helicopter because they don't come in with any preconceived ideas of how to do it. Whereas a pilot of a fixed wing aircraft has experience with fixed wing. So he expects the fixed wing to translate to the helicopter mm -hmm. and they don't. So it's a different environment, a different flight envelope. And so the person who's never experienced fixed wing flight doesn't have those preconceived notions and it's easier to eliminate the problems. So that's mm. what uh, this instructor said on the video I saw. And that's interesting because after flying a Cub, mostly through COVID, I was just messing around on Flight Simulator X and picked a helicopter, and it was a complete and utter disaster from the <laughs> get-go. So, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, it just doesn't do the things you expect it to right. do because it's right. a completely different, you know, you know, hovering is totally foreign to a fixed wing aircraft. And so you just have to rethink it. Uh, but so, yeah, that's that was what I had uh, seen on a video as one of the instructors was was definitely. Yeah, I'll take a, a, a non pilot over a pilot to teach them. Interesting. All right. Well, I wondered about that. <laughs> now, I, again, back to your stats. Now, this uh, this helicopter and our pictures that we have behind us, you can see mounted above and behind the cockpit uh, a couple of fuel tanks uh, is that it for the fuel or was there any internal fuel that this the that it carried 
No, that uh, on the later models, I think there were some that had tanks um, into the structure more in the earlier models. But for the and for the, the military, for the Sioux, and they are all those shoulder tanks. Uh, and I think I read they were like fifty-seven gallons a piece. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's it for the fuel. So uh, what was the range on this? Uh, two hundred and forty-six miles. Okay. And then, obviously, with all the different uh, applications, that would change. Uh, oh, sure, yeah. Carried passengers in those litters. What did you say they were called, the side uh, carriers? They were medical evacua evacuation panniers, P-A-N-N-I-E-R-S, right. panniers. That, that's a new word on me. I don't know that one. See, the, the History of Aviation podcast is also, uh, we support vocabulary expansion. And uh, definitely so pay attention, kids. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, there we go. Uh, something else you were talking about the, the you know, not having siding on the tail. Uh, the tail is flexible, which I didn't really realize. Uh, so it bends up and down, uh, and side to side, I assume. But uh, they were talking about the uh, the the shaft that runs from the engine to the tail rotor. Uh, it's got shorted pieces so that it flexes back and forth and all the gears that are in there where it connects are open to the environment so you have to grease those areas like every 12 hours of flight and if it rains on the helicopter you have to flush all the grease out because mm. it collects the water and doesn't work properly uh, so having it as an open air tail does have some problems because you know if you get water in it you've got to repair it well i'm confident that that makes sense in terms of the design and, and how it was used but it seems a little counterintuitive to have that kind of flexibility mm -hmm. um you know we we've all seen unfortunate videos of helicopters that have struck their own tail rotor with the main rotor um Yep. You know, things that have things that have gone wrong and and uh that to me just seems like it's not the not the safest way but it might be you know ease and maintenance and quick uh you know when you're doing all your pre-flight checks you can put eyes right on all that stuff and and make sure that everything is as it should be before you fly so there's the, oh, yeah, a trade-off but okay no, I mean, you know, the designers tested it. You know, they've got tolerances, and it obviously fit the tolerances. Well, I, I was going to say, on the helicopter I designed, it, oh, wait, I haven't designed one. I'll just have to trust <laughs> mm, that they knew yes. what they were doing. And again, as we as we often say, this is, this helicopter was designed almost 80 years ago. So um, clearly, they were on the something, and uh, very successful design all the, all these years. How many did you say? Fifty four hundred were built. 50, I think it's five thousand six hundred. Goodness gracious, that's, and that's pretty impressive for the first civilian helicopter. Yeah, it sure is first the certified uh, civilian helicopter. And actually, Bell no longer owns the rights to this helicopter. They sold it to a uh, what was the name of that company? Scott's Helicopter Services in Lesur, Minnesota. Uh, hmm. That's the company. If you need parts or repair or want to buy a new one, because there, I was reading from about ten years ago, they were looking at re, you know, starting the lineup again and building new ones. I uh, didn't see a lot about currently that you can buy one, but you know, with a you know upwards of a thousand of them still out there in the world flying, they need the parts, and so this uh, Scott's Helicopter Service is who you go to for your parts. There you go. As we're talking about the uh, Bale 47 here on episode 40 of the History of Aviation podcast, let's jump into closing thoughts, starting with you, Dave Gorman. Well, as I mentioned, uh, this is a happy memory of childhood at the age of five or six, despite your efforts to ruin it for me with truth and cold, hard facts. <laughs> I will continue to believe that Adam West as Batman was flying that helicopter and Robin helped him fight off that shark. That's just me. Also, uh, I watched MASH and watched it in reruns in college and, and uh, you know, seeing seeing this helicopter um, and, you know, an iconic design. If uh, 
if you ask most people to draw a helicopter in the seventies, it would have had a the soap bubble on the front of it. I'm sure if they if they mm -hmm. tried because that's what you saw, that's what you knew. So um, and as I mentioned, uh, I've only flown on a single helicopter one time. It was the the Bell forty seven G up at Oshkosh. I can't recommend it enough. The price is right, the time is right, and again, seeing from the air uh, that many aircraft, it's just it's fantastic. Check it out. Great helicopter. Absolutely. Great yep. David Rowe, closing thoughts. Uh, this is a beautiful, elegant, simple machine. Uh, it's so well designed that you can actually see one at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Uh, they have one on display because of its design. Uh, as, a, as a piece of art. As a yeah, as exactly not as a machine, but as a as a design, as a piece of art, it is you know in a museum for that. Uh, but you know everything about the Bell Forty Seven is functional. It's you know no frills, uh, no creature comforts. It's just a it's a pure utility helicopter. You know it's there to do what it does. It's not to be pretty. Uh, I heard a quote that Bert Rutan said: "If it doesn't help the aircraft fly." then remove it. And that's pretty much what Bell did. It's just the basics that are required to make a helicopter work. And it's been a true workhorse for, you know, 40, 50, 60 years now. Uh, so if it's flying 3,000 people in a week, it can do a job that, uh, you know, and does it well. So it's a, it's Definitely. amazing aircraft and, you know, it's great that we've still got it around and you can actually take a ride in it. So uh, I look well, forward to my, Making my it to Oshkosh. Was, yeah, I'm sorry. My flight was very stable. Uh, you know, it's smooth as can be. The pilot had total control. I, I felt extremely comfortable with, I mean, there was no real hovering, but just coming in for that landing and having that incredible field of view as you're as you're coming around and, and lining up and everything. It was, just, it was so awesome. Well, again, you got that big bubble canopy so you can see it all. And uh, yeah, I look forward to getting there and riding one for myself. Be a great time for sure. And David Rowe, if uh, folks head over to uh, airfile.com, your website there, will they see a Bell 47 or not caught one yet? I do not think I, mm, I'm trying to think if I've got a picture of it from when I was at the, uh, the Air Force Museum. There might be one in there, but other than that, I have not caught one flying. One, has so that's one something... hasn't cruised into Tri-Cities? No, it has not. So That would, that uh, would be an interesting day, wouldn't it? Yes, I would be running to the airport in a big hurry to get that. And your uh, your website's airfile.com, correct? That is correct. Come check me out. And uh, Dave Gorman, where can folks find you on social media? Well, I do have my, uh, my uh, YouTube video page at Gormania. Um, and I just checked to see the title of my video from my flight, uh, the Bell 47. It says, my flight in the Bell 47 helicopter at Air Venture. It's only three and a half minutes long or so, uh, but it, uh, it, it gives you a chance to see what I'm talking about with, with uh, the flight and all of the uh, aircraft on the ground. Gormania is it. I'm on Instagram, uh, underscore, it's Dave Gorman. And uh, while there's other content there, I do have a lot of stuff on aircraft, and aviation, and air shows as well. One of these days, David's going to help me put together a uh, a page just dedicated to, to my photography. Um, I'm confident, Dave, I'm going to call it Daviation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I like it. I, I, you know, you got to have a catchy name, right? Aerofile. I'm telling you, dude, you, you know, <laughs> if you haven't copyrighted it, or copy written it, you should, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Good. Check it. Check us all out there. Come come visit us on social media. Yeah, and you can see uh, all the history of aviation podcast social media in the description below. We got a Facebook group. Uh, we got a Facebook page. We got a website. We got the Instagram. It's all listed down below. You can simply just click that. I sure did enjoy it, guys. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Great, great topic, and uh, enjoy catching up with you guys and. Uh, it is 11 degrees or so in Knoxville right now. David, mm -hmm. what do you got up there in Bristol? Uh, last time I checked, it was about uh, 17 degrees going down oh, to a, about eight. A heat wave. A heat yeah. wave up there. Okay. Yeah, you all got it colder than we did. Derek, yeah, be I've, careful. I've, I've got 11 here. 
Uh, you guys listening at home, um, you might as well, since you're sitting around, go back to the archives and check out. Uh, let us know uh, what your favorite episodes are. There's lots to listen to. This is episode number 40. 40. So go back and, yeah, and there's, check them I all mean, out, folks. Shoot, we've done uh, the says the 172 was a great, they've been great episodes, but uh, you know, we've done what 172. What's some others that stand out? I, I loved our visit to the Tennessee Museum of Aviation with Neil Good and Ron melting up there and just checking and talking with them about uh, all the great things they're doing in Sevierville. That was awesome. Oh, yeah. Uh, Spruce Goose, P-51, uh, Apache Helicopters. Uh, what else? Corsair, Dave. Corsair, David. Uh, yeah, you know, that, I think Corsair. that one's okay. That's, that's an okay <laughs> plane. I don't know. It's just, yeah, it's just blue and it's got the cool wings and, you know, Pappy <laughs> Fluid and, uh, Gosh, all of those I mean, things. I need to go watch some videos of the Corsair now. Thank you. That's it. Well, like since it. you're going to get snowed in, or maybe not snowed in, just colded in. Colded you know, in, froze in. Yeah. Cool. All right. I appreciate it, guys. And we'll see everybody next week. So for David Rowe, Dave Gorman, I'm Derek Miller. Thanks for listening to the History of History Podcast. History of Aviation podcast with Derek Beeler, David Rowe, and David Gorman.